All right, Dan, we are live. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me, Dean. <laughs> thanks for coming on. So, so where am I finding you right now? Where are you guys? Uh, so we are in uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, um, and I'm just chilling on the living room floor with uh, the little Frankster. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we're looking forward to chatting. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I thought we'd just start we'll just kind of rewind the clock and start um, with just your childhood. And you grew up in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Right. And yeah. I'll just give some context uh, for people that end up watching or, or listening to this as well. That uh, So my wife, Jade, is your cousins. You guys are cousins. So that's yeah. how we know each other and how we got connected originally. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what was it like for you growing up in Winnipeg? Uh, that's, I guess that's a, that's a good question. I mean, uh, Winnipeg is a, you know, a city in the Canadian prairies. Um, and I think growing up anywhere probably is just like growing up anywhere. Um, I didn't know any different. It was just where I was growing up. Um, and uh, one thing I've learned having you know, lived other places and moved around is just how unique of a place Winnipeg might have been to grow up. Mm -hmm. uh, probably in that, um, you know, the, the winters for, for one thing. Um, also, growing up and being a kid, I mean, we didn't, you know, of course, no, no internet. So, uh, it was a city of, let's say around 700,000, which is a pretty good sized city. Yeah. Especially even I've been in the States for a while and a lot of American cities are not that big. Yeah. And, uh, it's, but it was very isolated in a way. It was a city surrounded by nothing. I mean, the, the next biggest city would have been Minneapolis, uh, 500 miles south, or you want to go east or west, we're talking about hundreds of kilometers, if not over a thousand kilometers to the next biggest city. Uh, I wouldn't even count Regina necessarily as a big city. Yeah. Uh, and that's a six hour drive or something like that away. That'd be the next closest otherwise. But, you know, and so it was kind of, uh, uh, it was also kind of a different time where everyone, in Winnipeg's from Winnipeg um, and also so I've lived in some places where uh, you meet especially New York where everyone you meet is from somewhere else mm -hmm. so that is interesting and people are very uh, different where I think like growing up in Winnipeg if someone was from Toronto you were like oh you're you're not from here I mean you knew because it was almost you know without the internet and the cities being so isolated in Canada, uh, that each city almost had its own recognizable cultural, even visual, um, aesthetic. And, uh, uh, so I think unique, uh, you know, each city had its own unique flavor. Uh, so being from Winnipeg, I probably have a little bit of that and don't even know it. Yeah, totally. Didn't know it. I'm especially at the time. And that's what I'm, that's what I mean. And sort of at the time, just, don't even know it yeah Frankie's jumping in there he's like he's like all right you're rambling dad come on <laughs> yeah actually there's two things that come to mind when it comes to Winnipeg but before I dive into that how many cities have you lived in and which cities have you lived in uh well I lived in <laughs> Winnipeg until I was 27 and then I lived in Vancouver uh until i was 30 and like vancouver uh, bc and then i lived in uh new york um brooklyn i guess until i was 36 uh and then uh philadelphia now and i'm i'm 40 yeah yeah and uh actually in like doing some like research for for a conversation i actually found a lot of 
similarities that you and I have. And uh, there's obviously a ton of differences as well. But what, like one of them is um, you're, well, you're not, you're, you grew up as an only child. I know you have step siblings, right? Yeah. So my dad had, has kids. So I've got half, yeah, step siblings. Yeah. And how, 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 how many years were you an only child for? Well, I guess I always was. I mean, uh, okay. they, my step siblings lived with uh, my dad uh, or at some points with their mom. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, so I, we never lived together. Okay. So you yeah. were mostly raised then only child. Yeah. 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 So I did spend some time uh, at my dad's growing up, but it would be like on the weekend or sometimes, you know, a little bit longer in the summers. Yeah. Uh, and he was always on a farm. So I actually got a little bit of that um, mm. exposure to that kind of like farm. You know, I've swathed and bailed field, uh, <laughs> you know, and also like hopped on the bus and like, you know, done, you know, been like a city kid. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so I got a couple of points here and I wanted to ask you about them. So one, um, so I asked a couple people that that knew you um about what you were like as a kid and uh someone said that one um one thing that people might not know about dan is that you wanted to be an artist as a really young kid all the way back in kindergarten is mm -hmm. that true that's true i always wanted to be an artist that's all I can remember wanting to be. And where, where, what, what's your first memory of that? And how did, how did you know that's what you wanted to do? Was it something, did you see some, some art and you're like, oh, I want to do that? Or wh where did that come from? <laughs> Jeez, that's a really good question. You know, I've never thought about that. Um, I've never thought about where that came from. It just was always that that's what I, always wanted to do here's jenna yeah <laughs> that's all right um hey oh hey jane hey jenna how's it going good you're in the podcast now oh really oh <laughs> really? <laughs> welcome back yeah um so you so you always wanted to be an artist even from from a kid yeah yeah, and uh, no, that's interesting. I mean, I just remember always, like, um, always drawing. I always wanted to, I was always trying to draw stuff. I, I would draw, I remember probably early on drawing, like, my my hand. Yeah. And then drawing, in, trying, you know, to draw inside and outside of it. Yeah. Um, and then... Um, drawing animals and then i got i you know and then i was given some like books because i guess i just probably just seemed like something i wanted to do or that i was doing so then um i just had support from you know whoever was you know my mom you know grandma like you know here's some paper let's draw whatever yeah it was just always a part I of that i heard that uh it was in grade seven, you were selected for an advanced learning program called GATE, which was called Gifted and Talented Education. Yeah. Um, and then you, so, so what happened there? You tried it and then what, what happened? Oh, well, this is probably a common thread throughout my life. Um, I tried it uh, and it just wasn't where my friends were. Mm -hmm. You know, I just... Uh, uh, I just, uh, wasn't, it wasn't, uh, it was fine, but, mm -hmm. uh, I just, I wanted to be with my friends. I mean, in that, that, uh, I try even in high school, I mean, you know, I, I like my, my crew by the end of a year might be kicked out of one school. So as a group, we would all go to another. So I think, I mean, I went to three different high schools, one of them twice, like, 
you know, it was, you know, by the time I graduated, I mean, there's only, that was only three years of high school. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was basically four schools. Um, wow. So, and it, and it wasn't about to actually no, uh, four schools and then one of them twice. Yeah. Cause I, I started at, uh, and actually this may be somewhat related to the, to the gate thing where, um, you know, I got, I, you know, I could, I could go into that and I tried it, but I didn't like it cause I wasn't with my friends. And then, um, um, you know, and maybe it wasn't as, you know, creative enough. And then when I went from junior high to high school, I wanted to go into, um, uh, like an auto mechanics, uh, uh, course. So I went to a, a technical school. Um, and again, just, you know, I, I was like, I think, I don't know if I was there for a day, a week, whatever it was. And I was like, yeah, you know what? My, my friends aren't here. What, what am I doing here? Mm. Actually, I wanted to talk about friendship and relationships for a bit as well, because mm -hmm. growing, where I was going with the similarity of you and I both being only children and mm -hmm. growing up as an only child is, you probably relate to this, is that um, for me, I found that my friends were my family growing up. Because I, I also, like you, I didn't have, I had cousins, but they were not around my age. They were either a lot younger than me or they were a lot older than me. And so, uh, yeah. so family get togethers, at least for me, were <clears throat> tough growing up as a kid just because, you know, I'm, like, yeah, I had a lot of great times as well. Not knocking yeah. my, my, uh, you know, my cousins or anything, um, but it, it, wasn't the same as hanging out with my friends. So I would actually bring my friends over to our place all the time. And I'd always have friends around. And that yeah. was, that was my family. Um, and so I think for, for you too, it sounds like, you know, the reason why you left gate and seems like a common thread is that, uh, you know, what, what, what values do you deem important in friends in in friends? Um, I guess, uh, uh, honesty, support, mm -hmm. loyalty, uh, it is, uh, and I mean, it is something, and, and I can completely relate to that because it was literally the same for me with, um, my, my family's great as you know, mm -hmm. uh, but again, but yeah, as a kid, I mean, my cousins were quite a bit younger, um, and then it was, you know, my aunt, my aunts and uncles and, and then me in the middle. So I was either, sometimes I, yeah, I would bring friends with me um, or I would, uh, I would man the camera. You know, I'd be like, I was the little video camera guy. Uh, Cause you know, I, I didn't, you know, there was, there was either no kids table or it wasn't where I wanted to hang out. And I, you know, in, at the adults table, um, yeah, it was a conversation I just listened to, which as an adult, I mean, I actually learned a lot just sitting around <laughs> listening to them, especially because, you know, there was a family business, uh, you know, so I actually like, I think I picked up a lot on that. But yeah, as a, a, you know, I didn't get that as a kid. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, and <laughs> talking about having younger cousins. So I, I reached out to a bunch of those younger cousins and one hilarious <laughs> thing that that came back was that um the nickname that they had for you as a kid and do you know what that is and can you explain what what it was um dan man dan man I, yeah um uh, but can i let you explain that because i actually don't yeah. i'm not sure okay I, i'm not sure exactly where that came so from. so i heard that it was you were dan man or dan the grand man because oh, yeah you were a grand man and they were all children. Yeah. And <laughs> so, so they called you a man, Dan, the grand man. And uh, so that, <laughs> that kind of just highlights just the age difference in right. uh, yeah. and what it was like, you know, being with all your cousins, you were, you were the grand man to all the yeah. children. Oh yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and it is, yeah, totally. Yeah. That's sure. I mean, funny. I babysat half of these, half of the, you know, these, you know, now grown ass people. Yeah. Uh, you know, I remember walking Jordy around changing his diaper. 
Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 It's, it's crazy. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you were, you were going to take an auto mechanics course, but then it wasn't where your friends were at, where you spent some time fixing up old cars. I've heard. Yeah, I still do. You still do. Where did that, um, how, how did you learn those skills if you didn't learn it from going to school? Um, I would say, uh, well, I, I, I would say that my interest in cars started from my mom. Um, I remember growing up and her having like old cars. Uh, we would go to uh, Unicity Mall parking lot and uh, she would do donuts in the winter. Um, and she would teach me how to drive when I was quite young, you know, on a Sunday in a parking lot, you know, safely. Uh, but I feel like my first memory of being behind the wheel of a car with her was in an old Ford Fairlane. Mm. Um, you know, I mean, so it's like I, I still have such a nostalgic feeling whenever I get into an old car. Uh, but it wasn't really until I was I think about 21 or 22 that I got into actually having my own and, and working on my own cars. And when I did that, uh, a good friend of mine was a mechanic and we would just, we would just get pizza and hang out and do whatever work needed to be done on my car, his, her car, that kind of situation. And, uh, um, and then by the time, you know, and then it basically became a sort of a thing where we were all of like my whole crew, it was all, we were all into cars and we would all just get together and fix up each other's cars and mm -hmm. um, spend a lot of time, a lot, a lot of time mm -hmm. doing that in my twenties. And I just threw, through friends, hanging through my out. Friends. Yeah. Through my friends hanging out. Yeah. That's amazing. That's yeah, so yeah. good. No, it was yeah, it was super fun. And it became a community. It started off as an interest and then it became a lifestyle in the community. I mean, I still I have I have a 64 Valiant right now that I've done most of the work on myself and uh yeah, I love it. Um I have a 1992 uh Ford that's the newest car I've ever owned personally. Yeah. Um, and sorry. No, that's okay. So that's, and then, I mean, we, uh, our family car, now that we have Frankie, I mean, we have, we have an Acura MDX. So that's like, I get in that. I'm like, Oh my God, it's a fucking spaceship in here. <laughs> you know? I'm like, I'm yeah. like, Whoa. But, all this, uh, all this technology. eh? Yeah. Yeah. And it's super great. It's fun. It, you know, and it's, uh, it's fast compared to these old things. Even, even when they sound good, they're not, as fast as the new stuff, but, uh, um, but there's nothing like it to me. There's nothing like just, you know, everything's more, everywhere you go is more fun getting there. In, yeah. In an old car. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. And motorcycles. I mean, you know, I've always had interest in motorcycles and road motorcycles too. Yeah. Um, when you, I want to jump back to when you're a kid for a second. Mm -hmm. Um, so I heard that you were a really good ball player growing up and you were also a Southpaw. So are you left-handed? I am. Yeah. I'm lefty. Lefty. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> that's interesting. I love, I love playing ball. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and when you were 15, you were scouted to play baseball with the Manitoba league and what, what happened there? Um, <laughs> Again, probably it just probably wasn't as fun. Um, and I don't know if I was good enough, maybe. Um, but uh, when I was quite young, I played hockey too, uh, like in leagues. Yeah. And, uh, and I stopped because of the politics and the angry parents. And I mean, I think I was like eight or something. And yeah. I was like, yeah, no, I'll go play scrub at the rank. 
um, yeah. you know, and you can keep your angry yelling parents to, yeah, you know, like that's not fun for me. I, and then, uh, my, uh, <laughs> okay. but, uh, then, yeah, then I think ball was the same. I love playing ball. It was super fun and, and, and challenging. And I remember going to the tryouts and it was very stressful. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I don't remember if I just wasn't, didn't make the cut or if I didn't want to do it. Um, because it just didn't, it wasn't, you know, it was too, too serious, too stuffy. Yeah. You, yeah, that was another similarity that I, I picked up as well was actually when I was a kid, my sport was always soccer, right? I grew up playing soccer. Yeah. Um, but I played a lot of other sports as well. And I, I remember, um, I got scouted for golf and there was a pro that wanted to take me under his wing and I know, you know, learn how to golf, be a really good golfer. And then right. same with uh, tennis as well. Mm -hmm. And there was a pro, I, I did like a summer camp, uh, like one of those mini university camps and it was uh, yeah. rack, racket sports and it, there was tennis, squash, racquetball, badminton, et cetera. And there was a, a tennis pro that wanted to, to take me, um, I don't know, under their wing and train yeah. me as well. But I just loved playing them and it was just fun. And yeah. I just didn't want to, I just didn't want to. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Um, so I can totally relate to the could have gone somewhere, probably might have not made it pro, but could have done something exceptional, but the, the want wasn't really there. And so I stopped. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So yeah, no, I totally feel that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, I also, uh, skate, uh, like I skate, I was skateboarding as well. And, uh, that was sort of, you know, and like an athletic outlet or create and also a creative outlet. Um, and something that I did with my friends and it was competitive, but it could be competitive with other people, but also really competitive or like challenging personally. Mm -hmm. um but it was also free there was no there you know there's no rules and mm. i could do what i you know i it could be fun and just to purely just to enjoy doing that and doing that with my friends where maybe you know also at a certain point my friends weren't playing ball or any of that other stuff we were skateboarding yeah yeah and uh yeah, I heard that like when when you stopped playing hockey, I heard that it was that you just didn't want to anymore, and mm -hmm. uh, and you even had um, like your coaches offer to come and pick you up and take you to the rink, and uh, and your mom was just like, no, like it's it's not about that, it's not about the ride, it's just uh, he just doesn't want to play anymore. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, which was awesome. I mean, and I think that was, I'm, I'm really grateful for that too. Yeah, totally. Well, it was nice that you weren't, um, you weren't forced to continue doing something right. that you were good at because I've met and mm -hmm. have friends that were pretty much forced uh, or guilted yeah. into continuing doing something that they're good at or that they don't want to do. And you were given the freedom to really do whatever you want to do. Yeah. 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 Make that choice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and can you, can you tell me about the time that you tried hitchhiking? <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. Let me, let me see. Well, I'm trying to remember how old I was even. Maybe I was 14 maybe okay like that. 14 or 15 maybe maybe i was 15 maybe, no i don't know i can't i'm not i don't remember maybe i was 15 okay but anyway yeah i had uh i was like just really into like 
kind of the punk rock uh, scene. And um, I had some friends that were hitchhiking around and I thought that would be something I wanted to try. And uh, uh, so I, yeah, I hitchhiked out to, uh, the, I only made it to Regina, first of all. Okay. Um, so I made it out to Regina and I was staying with some, you know, some punks here and there, figuring out how to live. And on, I mean, I was surviving on my own, um, sometimes sleeping outside, actually, even. Uh -huh. um, but it was always with a group of friends and um, we were so taking You didn't care. hitchhike by yourself? Or did you? No, no. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Uh, no, I got out there with a friend, mm -hmm. and then while I was out there, we were always with somebody, um, and we were taking care of each other. Mm -hmm. And um, but uh, uh, you know, I mean, pretty quickly I realized that I didn't have to do that. It wasn't for me. I wasn't. I didn't really fit in with that, and. Uh, so I decided to come home and, uh, but I wanted to make my own way home. So I found that the carnival was in town in Regina and I had worked, uh, <laughs> uh, I had worked the carnival as a caller in, uh, for one of the games. And um, just like for one summer while they were in Winnipeg, right? And okay. so I have found uh, um, the carnival in Regina. It was uh, the same carnival. And so I went and talked to the people there and uh, negotiated a ride home with pay uh, to help tear down um and so i yeah helped do the tear down of the carnival and then uh uh got paid for that and hitched a ride back as they were driving through i th i can't remember where they were going but they were passing through winnipeg so i got a, i got a lift home as well wow you actually made money on your way home <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That yeah. sounds like and I you're... remember. I remember that ride home. I had to pee so bad, <laughs> and it was just there was no stopping because it was. I mean, I think I was in a truck with like four other people, and it was just you know. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I there was no like, and I mean, it was also a caravan, right? So yeah, you're yeah. not like, oh hey, uh, yeah, yeah, you, you know, can we hit the next? rest stop <laughs> yeah. but i remember awesome. thinking i was gonna piss myself yeah yeah what um <clears throat> what was your first entrepreneurial like venture that that you did uh actually probably before then so maybe i was maybe i was 14 13 14 when i my my first one uh or my first like little uh little business maybe you could call it i um i had uh um i think i you know was i'm not really sure what sort of started it but this is what happened i um i made some t-shirts um and uh so my mom was working at um the family business and uh one of the uh, students at the school uh, that was the family business was a, a college and one of the students was an artist and I had been working uh, some summertime uh, time out at my dad's and he was raising wild boar at the time mm. and so I had been working with the wild boar and then I was also skateboarding and uh, so I had an idea to combine skateboarding with wild boar. And so had this 
artist draw up a wild boar, like a caricature of a wild boar with a skateboard. He even had a martini glass, which was kind of funny because I was like a little kid. But um, and uh, anyway, so took that artwork and had uh, had that screen printed at a you know a t-shirt printing place. And I think I probably pre-sold them to family, you know, and friends and whatever, and uh, basically made enough uh, to buy a skateboard. And that was it. So I, I never reprinted them or anything. I just, you know, I got a skateboard out of it and that was cool with me. That's awesome. And, uh, and I, I'm going to jump forward a little bit. I heard that when you were 19, you started, um, you were a cobbler. Is that correct? Yeah. Yep. So how did you, how did you decide to get into that? Going back to hearing like when you were young, you just wanted to draw and then cobbler is a, a totally different skill set. So what, and then starting t-shirts, like what, what was the switch from 13, 14 to like 19? Well, it's funny. I mean, this is how I see it. So I have been doing, I mean, I started working when I was young as well. And, uh, and, and, uh, and I think, I mean, we used to laugh about how many different jobs I had and how many different, like the wide variety of things that I did. I would do something for a little while and I would just then go, okay, that was interesting. Let me try something completely different. Like, you know, I mean, yeah, I, I ran a, main uh like a little like a bar at a horse race track i wrote you know drove a dump truck i was a roofer i worked at a suit uh store like selling uh suits i did quality assurance at a telemarketing play i mean i just you know like so many different things it's just um something else we have in common ah that's cool yeah yeah. And, uh, but anyway, when I was 19, I was, uh, you know, I was still, still into punk rock and probably had a mohawk or something at the time, but I was like always looking for something new to do. And I was walking through mall, Pole Park actually. Hmm. And there was a shoe repair shop in there, uh, with a help wanted sign. And so I just, I just thought, okay, that's interesting. I just kind of checked it out for a little, for a minute and uh and it was like this this you know old guy with a long gray ponytail and a long gray beard he had like these round you know uh like spectacle glasses on you know uh leather leather smock and uh um i thought he was pretty neat i thought all right well let's check this out see what's up so um i would talk to him he ended up giving me a job and I uh, fell in love with it. So to bring that back to sort of always wanting to be an artist and going from drawing to cobbling, I, uh, uh, I was lucky that the guy that hired me was uh, a craftsman. He was a true craftsman. He was like a second generation cobbler. He really loved what he did and uh not a not all those guys most of those guys don't i mean it's just a job uh but he he loved it and uh i think i was just lucky to get in there with him and um i had also from the time i was young especially with skateboarding like i i would wear a hole in my shoes from skateboarding so i would take the leather patch from my jeans and i would take that off and i would sew it onto my shoe and then I would shoe goo over it. And then, you know, uh, so I would, I would repair my shoes as a kid too. And then without re realizing what I was doing. Um, and then also too, beyond that, I would go from, I'd go to Value Village and get uh, some old man pants. And then I'd bring them home and I would cut them into shorts and I would split the inseam and sew a tie into there and change the shape um i was so i was modifying my clothing too so i think that's also being an artist i just feel like any any sort of way you're creatively thinking and, and using your hands to manipulate something is is an art form you're changing something from 
one thing to another is is a, is an art form. Yeah. Even now I'm doing a uh, home renovation and uh you know tiling a wall is an art form. I mean, you know, any of this stuff these you know, I think half of these guys don't even see what they do as art, but I I look at it that way. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And and how long were you uh, a cobbler for there? Well, at that shop? Or, or well, well, I'd so, say you're, yeah. you're still a cobbler, right? Well, I, th- I mean, I guess it's sort of a trade that I have that I think yeah. I'll probably never lose now. Yeah. Um, but I did that for over 10 years. I mean, I, I had, uh, I worked uh, with him. And then from there, I went and I actually ran a mm. shop uh, by myself. Um, right. And until that owner sold that shop. Um, uh, and there's a funny story there. So I, I, uh, um, I had the opportunity to buy that shop. Yeah. And I think I was, oh, she's 19 or 20. I mean, I, you know, I barely just like started doing this stuff. And, um, but I was now running a shop, doing all the books, ordering all the materials, doing all the work. And I remember my grandfather saying, well, you know, you, why maybe you should buy this you know you don't you're already doing you're already doing it you know and i thought i was like no i'm too young i can't i don't want to be tied down you know to like you know owning my own business i'm like i'm a teenager you know and i was like i mean and then you know it's funny because then like i was uh um, i worked at other shops and did a handful of other things but then i opened my own shop uh, when I was 24, uh, and realized that that was, uh, you know, I mean, um, that his advice was good, but I had to get some life out of the way first, uh, be, because, uh, he was right. That was my freedom, but I thought it was going to tie me down, mm. you know, cause I went from that to just working for other people again for another four or five years. Yeah. You know, and I learned a lot from that, but I, you know. You uh, also learned what you didn't like, and then totally. you, you could yeah. figure, or you figured out that you could create your your own and make it your own and actually get freedom from that. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm going through that process right now as well. <laughs> so I'm learning that that as well. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And uh, so I heard that that business was called These Boots. Yeah, These Boots. These Boots, uh cobblery and custom leather and can you can you um there's one story that came out of that actually was uh you designed is it a skate for a girl and i'll leave it at that if that jogs your memory do you know what what that's about can you just can you share that um that story and how that came about yeah so that was uh so actually it was the through a friend of a uh like family friend um there was a girl that was uh um missing um a part of her arm and uh and she was uh she was playing i i don't know if it was ring at or hockey but uh uh one of those and uh sports and and she was kind of getting to an age where um the coaches, it wasn't really uh, a good idea for the coaches to be in there with her alone and, and like tying up her skates. Um, and so it became a real uh, difficult uh, situation because she couldn't uh, um, get ready with everyone else. She couldn't do, she just didn't, wasn't, you know, that sort of like was a barrier between her just uh, being able to sort of uh, do that with everyone else like everyone else and so I was just presented with the opportunity to think about a way to uh, modify her skates uh, so that she could do that herself so I just I just put ratcheting snowboard bindings on her skates so that with one hand she could um, put her skates put the you know she could uh put the ratchet strap in ratchet those things i mean she could tie her skates tighter than anyone else out there totally you know with those things on there i mean 
and fast, you know, put that yeah. on, you're out, you're out. She could be the first one out there. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Anyway, that was fun. That was a really fun. Project. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. You were able to give her independence. Right. That's what she was, she was, uh, she was needing, especially around that age. Right. So you were able yeah. to help, help support with removing that barrier. <laughs> That's so cool. I love that. I never heard that story, but that's, oh, yeah. awesome. that's so good. Um, what, uh, so you, you were in Winnipeg up to, uh, what age and what, and then you moved to, is it Vancouver? Yeah. Vancouver, British Columbia. I was in Winnipeg until I was 27. And before Winnipeg. moving to Vancouver, I also heard that you were in acting as well and you took acting courses through the family uh yeah. college as well mm -hmm. yeah um what 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 was that like what did you what did you love about getting into acting and what sort of stuff did you do in in acting well i mean i love there was so there were so many things that i loved about it it was it was just also a real nice break um and uh, just a sh uh, it was like shifting gears into some other creative outlet. Uh, I had opened the shop in, tw in when I was 24, um, and it was just to give you a little bit of perspective on it. I was it was just me. Um, there were two storefronts on the main floor, and the second floor was a two bedroom apartment. Um, and then there was a little garage in the back, but, uh, um, basically the, the whole family, uh, and some friends helped renovate that place or, you know, fix it up over a couple months, uh, so that I could move in. So I lived upstairs, uh, and then I could open my shop and, um, but the thing was, is that that's, that became my entire life. I was 24 and I, all I did was work. Um, I had all my friends, but they would just come to the shop and see me. Um, and, you know, sometimes we would get a chance to go and do some stuff or whatever. But really, uh, I started, I, I opened the shop and got busy really right away. And uh, uh, so I would open and I would just work. I'd, I'd pick up a job and, uh, and then a customer would come in. So I'd put it down and then I'd deal with the customer take in their project and then uh, pick that, you know, uh, job up again. And then a customer would come in and, you know, so it'd take me all day to do something. And uh, uh, so then by the end of a day, I would close shop and then I had a day's worth of work to do. So, you know, it, it became a thing where I was working day and night just to keep up. It was also at a time when, I mean, I'm 40, this, I was 26, um, and at that time, I mean, uh, I couldn't hire anyone to help me. I tried at one point, and uh, uh, young people were not interested at the time in doing, you know, that hands-on creative stuff. It was really about computers and new technology, and, um, and then the old guys that did know what they were doing and were retiring uh wouldn't come and work for me because i was 24 years old and i'm like you know they're like i'm not fucking working for you i'm like no it's not like that but anyway i couldn't get any any help so it just it, i just kind of burned me out um and then there was uh, um one christmas i closed for the holidays and then i just didn't open the door again and uh and then, um, and then I was snowboarding and uh, broke my back. I had a, you know, a couple of compression fractures in my back. So that put me out for a while. Uh, so next thing I knew, you know, I had closed for Christmas holidays. And then it was a couple months later till I was back on my feet. And, uh, and I was like, you know what, I just, I, I was, just so um, burnt out from the just that twenty four seven thing that I just was like I'm not I'm not 
I know what's, I know what's going to happen when I open the doors again and I don't want to do that. Yeah. And uh, so I ended up uh, selling the building and, uh, and, you know, getting rid of the stuff in the shop. And um, I ended up making some money on the building and uh, uh, paid back a couple of things that I owed and then uh, had some money to put myself up in an apartment downtown. And, and then, of course, I was lucky enough that the family business was a college and they were doing a acting for film and television course that I could just take. Um, and it was a one year course, so I took it and, uh, and I loved it. It was, uh, it was, um, being creative without breaking my back. It was, a it was a mental thing and not a physical thing. Mm. And, um, and it was also, I mean, I think like, this is funny, but I feel like the, the things that you learn to be an actor or to like, you know, emote is that you, you have to learn about yourself and emotions. And it was like, it was like really some life changing stuff that I wasn't expecting. It just, it was just, I mean, I still feel, uh, I still live with a lot of that stuff that I learned. Um, and, uh, um, and so it just sort of was something that, you know, I really, I really enjoyed. And then I ended up with an agent out in uh, Vancouver hmm. uh, through that, uh, through some, you know, some auditions. And I mean, I, I went and tried out for that uh, to, to get that agent. Um, and I had done some student films and stuff in Winnipeg. And then, uh, and then when I was out in Vancouver, I did a lot of like auditioning. I did a Tim Hortons commercial that never was aired. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for, where I had for, to jump in a lake, actually. Yeah. For, for anyone that's outside of Canada that might end up watching or <laughs> listening to this, Tim Hortons is a really big <laughs> chain <laughs> across Canada, and I think now yeah. they're in the states. I think. Yeah, there are some in the states. Yeah, but there I mean, are, I guess yeah. like if you were on the east coast, it'd be like a Dunkin' Donuts, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So that's a big, that's a big deal. It didn't it get aired, but that's still a big deal. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. yeah. So. It was, you know, it was cool. And then I did a, you know, an art film that really like, uh, was pretty special, but, um, but, you know, while I was doing that, I was, uh, uh, then also back, uh, wanting to make art. And, uh, in Vancouver, I had a studio where I was making art and, uh, you know, just because of my experience, um, I ended up doing a lot with leather um and it was it was wall art uh but i wasn't drawing but i would be collaging and painting and stuff with uh you know leather and um yeah all kinds yeah. of stuff yeah i want to take i want to see if i can get a picture of um the the leather dragon art mm -hmm. piece that you created that's in your in your grandparents place and i remember going down there <laughs> and seeing that and just being like floored. I was, I, I'd never seen anything like that. Um, and I, and I, I was talking to uh, your grandma before our conversation and uh, she, she had told me a story about uh, their neighbor, uh, Barry, yep. who is an artist and Barry and, uh, and your grandpa Dawn was, you know, they were talking about art and your grandpa's also, he was an artist and well, actually, yeah, that's, that's, that's one right. Of his, yeah. One of his yeah. pieces right there. Yeah. But they, Here, check it out. There's one right there. Yeah. Where, where, there you go. Right there. Yeah, yeah. Right there. Yeah. yeah. We got one like that in the hallway too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's definitely some artistic and entrepreneurial ship in that runs in the family. Oh yeah. Um, but, uh, but Don and Barry were talking one time about, um, art and saying you know like i think it was uh barry that said you know like don we can put paint on a canvas but like i've never seen anything that dan can put leather <laughs> on a canvas and, and create art like that so i definitely want to put a link to that in in the show notes because it uh kind of speaks volumes to what what we're talking about you need, and you need to vis visually see it it's uh it's beautiful and i guess awesome. that you probably got a lot of literally like hands-on experience 
from modifying clothes at a young age to also modifying, um, oh, just being a cobbler as well, right? And you, and yeah. what, what is it about leather that you liked working with? Like why choose leather over something else? Uh, I think it was just, it's really versatile and really pliable as a material. It's, uh, um, uh, it's, it's difficult. Um, I like sometimes tedious work. Uh, like I love doing tile work for that reason, or, mm -hmm. um, there was a piece that's at, uh, um, your in-laws a couple, uh, uh, at your in-laws place there actually, uh, and it's two pieces mm -hmm. and it's, it's squares. And, uh, there's a couple of two big circles in it, but the, but the rest of it are squares and it was uh um just the the whole point of all of that was just to make <laughs> these squares that interlocked uh where there was um there uh but there were rules right there's like um there's no dead space like so if you imagine a square um if they're like opaque you would never see the background. So every square overlaps. There's no dead space, but no square is within a square. Every square, mm -hmm. and then there's no square that's more than double or whatever. There's like these silly rules in it, except for one. And, and see if you ever see it. There's, only, there's one square within a square, but there's something like 1,600 squares in there. How long did that take you? And how long did the, uh, the dragon piece take you? Oh geez, I don't even remember. I I could I didn't log hours. It was just so it just uh, um, it's just so tedious. I mean, um, you know, and the dragon was the first one I did. Actually, it was the first one ever. Uh, <laughs> That's insane. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, and I mean to just to give reference, it's about the size of a door. You know, yeah, like the front huge. door. It's huge. Um, and uh, and you know, you're doing it with little tools like where the end of that tool is like a screwdriver. Right. So, um, so very tedious work. Yeah. Um, and that, that, uh, one with the squares, I mean, it starts with a drawing. So I drew those, all of that and then transferred that to a transfer paper and then transferred that onto the leather and then carved it into the leather. So it was about four different uh, steps steps well yeah like basically redoing it four times to have that final wow. you know piece and then yeah and did you have art uh, exhibits in uh in vancouver i did yeah i did um i had I, stuff in a couple of uh uh group shows um i did also get a couple art grants uh, to make art um like as awards, um, and then and then I had a I had a solo show uh, that had nothing to do with leather. Actually, it was a um, it was I had done a little thing for a group show that was an origami uh, piece, and the the theme of the show was that group that group show was like mint, it was like minty, you know. So like whatever whatever that was. So I use like these pastel like blue and green paper to make these cranes and then I had an idea I wanted to there was a fam friend, family friend whose son was like um, <laughs> was so, diagnosed I yeah no there was a family friend diagnosed with uh, whose son was diagnosed with uh, uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma and he was like a little kid I think he was nine at the time and um he uh um nine or 12 i can't remember um but he uh i had heard about this story about um uh like uh in japanese culture about the uh the um gift of a thousand cranes and it was uh um uh you know, if you, the, the crane is a mythological creature, has, has some mythological um, abilities and it, it can grant you, uh, you know, wealth or uh, long life or a cure for illness. And, uh, um, and you can, uh, if you make a thousand cranes, you can 
be granted that wish. And uh, so I kind of thought, well, this might be a great idea for um, an art show and also to uh, do some, you know, try and, you know, do something. So I, I folded, uh, well, 2000 cranes was my, was my goal. And, uh, uh, because I thought, fuck it, might as well, you know, if, if one, so give me one, let's do twice and let's, let's yeah. double it up. Yeah. Let's double it up. So, yeah. um, so I did that and it was, it was, a it was a great show. Um, and I had made some special ones. I did even sell some stuff and I also took, uh, quite a few of them and hung them in some trees um in uh in the downtown east side um and uh and then i sent uh sent one to to him to uh the family and then uh he had been given a uh wish with the with the uh make a wish foundation mm. and uh yeah so he went he went to uh japan and uh, put that crane in a river in Japan. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. He, he was given the wish because uh, he was, uh, you know, terminal. And then, uh, yeah. Uh, but he did. He ended up beating it. Um, <laughs> not, to, not <laughs> to say that that's. <laughs> I would never suggest that that was because of the cranes, but it was just beautiful. It was because he doubled it up, Dan. That's right. It was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's amazing. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so that was, I mean, that was my my only uh, group show, but that was, uh, that's good enough for me. That's cool. <laughs> that's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. I, I, I didn't know that. That's, uh, that's awesome. Now everyone yeah. can watch us both get emotional. So that's <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, well, actually talking about acting and, and you were talking about what you learned through like, and I was talking to a friend actually recently, cause that's something that, that I also want to get into more is, is acting. And <clears throat> you were talking about how you were able to emote a lot of different emotions and how that's carried on. And, you know, definitely like a, a skill that will just help you in life as well. And I was also talking to a friend not long ago about, um, we're talking about business and, and running a business. And um, I was, I was talking about encouraging more business owners to uh, be more playful. Oh yeah. And, uh, and he's like, Oh, that's very interesting. Like, why, why do you think that? And, and part of my answer was actually going back to, as I was talking out loud, I kind of solidified some thoughts and was able to connect some dots and it, and it came back to, um, what it means to like be a man and like masculinity and you know we're talking about you know when you grow up um i know a lot of boys are told you know like suck it up and you know bury your emotions and anyways i just think that's a whole crock of shit and i think a lot of yeah a lot of uh like young young men and men i think could be uh, I know could live a lot more fulfilling, rich life if you actually allowed yourself to feel whatever emotions you need to feel, not just sadness or if you need to cry or whatever, but, mm -hmm. you know, like, let it come, let it go. And then you'll feel a lot better afterwards, not bottling things up. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> that's definitely something that I really admire about you is that you, you definitely wear your heart on your sleeve and you're oh, yeah. not, not afraid to, uh, you know, get, emotional and uh so thank you for sharing that beautiful story i really well thank appreciate you. that thank you. yeah and uh what what sort of like i don't know tips would you give people maybe that like don't have the ability to like take an acting course or something but like were there activities or something that you guys would yeah. practice to be like okay we need you to you know we're going to dive into this scene and it's going to be fill in the blank emotion. How, how do you tap into your emotions and start like feeling that and bringing that to the surface? Uh, that's really good. Um, <laughs> uh, it, because I think like, 
uh, it's one of, I mean, I think acting is sort of like a, you know, any maybe art form where um, anybody can be taught sort of the technical things, but uh, you know, there's something special that a, good, a great artist has, right? Yeah. Um, but the thing about that I think that anyone can get from this is that it's like, or what I was like, wow, this is, this is the, this is it. And this is why it was so life changing for me is it was, uh, it's communication. That's all it is. It's, um, so you have to listen, uh, because you can't feel or react. It's about communication and reaction. Right. And so, uh, when we're talking, if I'm not looking at you, or listening to you, you know, I can't properly understand, first of all, what you're trying to say. Um, and then also figure out a way to react to you and respond in, in a way that I want to get my point across. Uh, and so it was really just these like exercises in uh, looking people in the eye uh, mm -hmm. and not saying anything, you know, and listening and just being like, present with people um you know because uh yeah i mean a, a life is full of subtleties and if you're just you know like living in, with the broad strokes i mean you're missing all you're missing all the good stuff you know it's it's uh it's the little things and it's just um yeah i just think um it made me more um uh made me try and see more and and like learn more about anyone I, I, about communicating with people like i want to know how you're feeling you know yeah. yeah yeah i think the uh that that's been something that i've been more aware of too especially through this weird time of covid and everything is actually just um like being more present and like now everyone has been given permission whether they like it or not to actually sit with themselves and their thoughts yeah. and you know deal with whatever they've been putting off because they've been going at whatever life pace uh, they've been going at and doing whatever they've been doing whether that's you know the most important thing that they should be doing or not I, I don't know but um, I think just that that importance of like awareness and living in the present moment is so key because I think a lot of people spend a lot of time either thinking about something that's in the future or in the past and mm -hmm. uh, and not spending enough time in your day being present so right. thank you for that reminder that's like <laughs> yeah that's so important that's really wow. good yeah um, thanks and that I think that's something that anyone can can do, whether or not you even want to go into acting or not. Is just check oh, yeah. in. just just check in and be present and yeah. and uh, be there with yourself, and then also be there with your partner or whoever else you're you're with, right? Mm -hmm. And not be thinking about something else. Yeah, 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 yeah. Love that. For sure. Um, what uh, what gives you the courage to try new things? Hmm. I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. I think, I think it's just, I mean, I just think it's something that comes naturally. Like I, I get excited about change and uh, trying something different. Um, you know, and maybe that's not it, it always been a, a you know, uh, where it's like, a, you know, I don't know, um, where maybe I've, that's been part of where I've, get, you know, I've uh, moved around so much or tried so many different, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, ways of, uh, uh, you know, business or uh, art or whatever. Do you have a favorite? I think I just always, yeah, I just, I mean, it's still hard. Yeah. Yeah. Like I know a lot of uh, people that are afraid of change, so they don't make the decision to try something new, right? Like it's, it's uncomfortable being 
uncomfortable. And mm-hmm. so why would you want to step into that uncomfortable zone? Um, yeah. But I think that's when typically you grow and you learn something new. And then yeah. I think you also, I don't know, that's kind of like the zest of life is when you're oh, in yeah. an uncomfortable situation and you're doing something that you've never done before. Mm-hmm. And then you work th- through it and then often your fears aren't as bad as you thought and you've learned something along the way and right that's kind of I know I think the beauty of art and trying new things yeah um well and you bring all those things into whatever you do next as well right totally you know yeah yeah and I mean having just tried a bunch of stuff I think uh one thing I've realized in time is that a lot of this is all related it everything's all related in some way or another i mean a tool is a tool you know i mean you just got to learn you know how to apply it to what you're doing right yeah um why why'd you move to new york from vancouver ah uh, well oh geez um talking about change and going <laughs> uncomfortable and moving to a whole other country yeah. and and one of the you know great cities of the world yeah well I think I think uh you know I had been in Vancouver for a few years I met uh, some great people that I'm even still good friends with uh great friends with from there Mm -hmm. uh but uh I didn't uh it just I mean I never really uh felt completely at home there um and uh it just didn't feel like my city or like, you know, my home. And, um, and then when I was, when I turned 30, instead of like going home or, you know, get in my mom, you know, was like, um, let's maybe, why don't we like meet up in New York? Um, instead of like, uh, you know, a visit home or whatever. And uh, I was like, great. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so we went to New York. Um, I was doing, so from that solo show that I did with the cranes, I had, uh, uh, some workshops, uh, that, uh, you know, I was, uh, uh, that I did as well. And one of them was an origami workshop, like how to fold paper cranes and then, and a flower as well. Uh, but then I also, I was doing shoe stuff out in Vancouver as well. And, uh, so I did a moccasin making workshop, um, and then that caught on and I became, that's how I made a living out there at at a certain point was doing these workshops. Um, but then I also was like making, uh, you know, I turned it into sort of like having like a little line of them and that I was trying to sell at some shops. So then when I parlayed our trip to New York into, uh, a scouting trip, um, for my moccasin brand. And uh, so uh, we toured around New York and Brooklyn um, to all these cool shops. And I had made these little, um, you know, these little line sheets uh, for my shoes, moccasins, and uh, and tried to, you know, get, uh, you know, shops to stock my stuff. Um, and then also while I was, uh, while I was there, I was going out on my own. Um, cause I was from coming from Vancouver where, you know, it was three hours earlier. And so, and my mom was only one hour earlier from New York. Uh, so, you know, she'd go, she'd be in bed yeah, at whatever time. And then I'd be like, all right, well, I mean, I'm, I'm going out. So I, so I was going out and then also just like meeting people and having fun and, and doing, you know, uh, my own thing. Um, and then anyway, when I got back to Vancouver, I was like, it just sort of was like, as soon as I got back, I was like, nah, I'm going to go, I'm going to go out to New York and get, uh, try that out. Cause I, it, it would just reinforce like, yeah, this place is not for me here. Like I was just was not getting what I needed out of it. And, uh, yeah. Um, so I went to New York and I had, I had actually met somebody. So I was like hanging out with them out there too. So it was like, it was fun. You know, it was fun. Yeah. It was big, it was a big move. It was a risk, 
Um, I did no proper planning. Like as far as uh, I didn't have a visa, I was there as a guest, you know, <laughs> and then I way overstayed my welcome. You know, I was 30, I'm 40. I just got my permanent like green card. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, you were there for uh, a little bit over six years. Yeah, in New York, yeah. In New York. Yeah. And so, yeah. Um, see, I want to dig into like how, how do you make a big decision like that? Um, <laughs> but I, it's so well, hard to articulate because we've done the same. Like we've moved, um, yeah. you know, away from Winnipeg and we're in BC as well. We're in the Okanagan, about a four hour drive from Vancouver. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I've like, I've talked to people that are just like, how, how did you move? Like, how do, how do you know when to pull like a big life change like that? Like we changed our careers. We changed uh, where we live. We moved away from family and, you know, like you got to meet new friends. Like how, how do you do that? I don't know like the answer other than like oh. lifestyle. I think also uh, at least for, for us and feel free to add your two cents mm -hmm. to this as well. Cause I think it would be, it'd be helpful for people. I find that a lot of like Winnipegers tend to stay in Winnipeg and yeah. then, you know, they travel to a lot of different places, but they end up coming back to Winnipeg. Um, and, uh, I think lifestyle was one, um, for me too. I think like, you know, family is very important. Um, but how much time do you spend with your family compared to with either your partner or whatever? And you can't, I mean, you can't make everyone happy and you know, it's really great. The 1%, 2%, whatever, even if it's a really cl like close family, like you guys have a very close family, 10% mm -hmm. of like your overall time is spent with with them but your other percent of your time is so much larger as you get older and you're an adult and now mm -hmm. you're living your own life you can't you can't just be as physically accessible because i got this other life and goals and things going on that i that it's my life and that that's what i want to explore and do and i know there's pros and cons and there's sacrifices that you give up and uh and everything but like how how have you um i don't know been able to like make big moves um to other countries and then even be in a situation where you can't physically <laughs> visit because you've overstayed your your visa how um like what's some of the self-talk that that you have like told yourself in going through those like lonely tough times like how how did you i don't know keep going uh i think it's i think it's just uh um really like about priorities and uh where you are in life at the time and mm -hmm. i mean things that i thought i would never do uh or feel i feel now uh just because i'm older or something has changed i mean um so i think when these big things come up it's it's a um i feel like i'm open to opportunity and uh and when something good comes along i want to really take a look at it mm -hmm. and i think that the decisions are just about where we are at that time like you know, um, my decision making on these big things is so different than it was. I mean, I have a whole different set of responsibilities. Um, it's not just me anymore. You know, it's me and Jenna. And then uh, it wasn't just me and Jenna. Now it's me and Jenna and Frankie, you know, um, you know, and then it's also, you know, we have a business, we have a home. There's also, um, just different uh needs like um you know i think when i was younger it was really uh, you know i wanted to you know i was like uh 
I didn't know if I could do what I needed to do in Winnipeg. And then I went to Vancouver and then I was like, I don't know if I can do what I need to do in Vancouver, you know? And then I went to New York and I was like, wow, what can I do in New York? And, uh, you know, and then, you know, it's, uh, you know, and then, and then I was with uh, Jenna and it was a partnership and, you know, okay, cool. Let's, let's see what we can do in Philadelphia. Cause that was another opportunity for Jenna out here. And then, you know, I mean, it's just, um, but I mean, really, re regardless of how many of those different things are piled on, I mean, we're making, we're still making big moves and big life decisions for sure. You know, yeah. I mean, we're, we're not, we're, uh, um, yeah, we just uh, um, decided we were going to buy Jenna's grandparents house congrats <laughs> thanks <laughs> so that's up in Boston just south of Boston that's in Braintree Massachusetts yeah and uh so um and this is just happening I don't even know I don't know if you knew that no no I didn't no, no. but uh yeah and if, you know this is brand new and yeah. uh, um but you know there's a lot of uh reasons for that so mm -hmm. um family is one of those and uh it's it's just an opportunity for us to get into this house here and to be uh closer to some family mm -hmm. uh, it's jenna's family in this case and yeah. uh um when you're talking about you know how we spend our time i mean we pretty much when we have that time is we go see my family or we go see her family mm -hmm. um and I think this is a great way to um, have Frankie close to some family, but also be able to spend more time with other family, both her family and mine. Yeah, for sure. Uh, because we're not splitting that time up anymore mm -hmm. uh, in that way, in that yeah. same kind of way. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, so it's just a whole different thing where, I mean, I think like I moved to New York cause it was like uh, fucking cool. And I was like, you know, how can I disrupt like, you know, what I'm doing and like, like, what can I, you know, how can I be inspired by this? Right. Yeah. Um, so it's very different. Yeah. Actually, there are very different reasons for some really big moves, you know? Yeah. I want to, I want to read a segment that I, I printed off here and it was from um, the Tim Ferriss podcast, which I'm a big fan of. And he had uh, Adam Savage on as his guest. And Adam Savage is the co-host of Mythbusters. He was the, um, not the guy that wore the toupee, the, the ginger guy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I remember. So, yeah. so this is Adam talking. And I think at the time Adam moved from New York to San Francisco. So I think he's talking, um, reflecting back on his time that he spent working and living in New York. And I didn't know this, but he was also a sculptor as well before he did Mythbusters. So I'm going to read this because he's talking about New York. And I want to get your, your, your thoughts around this. All so, right. And I listened to this actually like over a year ago. And when I started the podcast, I had wrote down in my notes a list of guests that I wanted to have on my podcast. And one was you. And, uh, and then I came across this podcast that I was listening to and I was like, oh man, I got to make sure that I repeat this to Dan and I want to hear his, his two cents on it because, uh, I think it is, he's a very clear thinker and he articulates, I think something that not a lot of people might have heard before or think about New York. So anyways, that's my preamble. So here's, here's what he says. So he says, um, the thing that I now understand is that Manhattan is an amazing city. If you know, this is what I underlined, if you know what you want out of Manhattan. It is a place built on and for ambition. And the people who get their work out and get seen in Manhattan have busted their ass to do it because it's, a sing it's the singular focus in their life. And it means culturally it's a really important city because only the stuff that has been fought for gets to your attention. And I think that many great cities are like that. LA is totally like that, Chicago, London, etc. The world's greatest cities are worlds where the culture is something, the culture 
of those cities is a competitive one. But if you don't know what you want to do, a place like Manhattan is a very cold and weird place. It's not going to open its doors to you and you're not going to be able to stumble into your ambition. And so after five years there of kind of trying several different careers and several different job paths and still not having a singular focus, I moved to San Francisco, which is, I think, one of the great cities in the world for finding your ambition. Oh, interesting. So he goes on. This is a few paragraphs, so I apologize for the length, but it's, it's good. Oh, yeah. So he says, it means that some of the culture here is not as good. It means that everyone, if you want to have your artwork in a gallery, San Francisco, you can do it within a few months. Um, it's not as hard to do here as it is in a place like LA or New York. And I think that uh, it has its good points and its bad points. Again, like I said, I think some of the culture here, some of the stuff you go out to see at night isn't necessarily as rigorous as it might be in a city like LA or New York. But at the same time, it saved me because I was able to call myself a sculptor and have my work in like 40 group shows in the first two years I was in San Francisco. I got huge amounts of feedback from people about what that work meant to them and it gave me perspective in what it meant to me and it slowly allowed me to sort of build an ethos of what I wanted to do with my hands and my life and when I ended up stumbling from the theater industry into the film industry film and commercial television special effects was where I all of a sudden saw that everything I'd been doing was leading towards this like this was an industry in which all of my excitement and creativity and passion and drive could be pointed in a singular direction and so I was like, oh, I'm going to give everything over to this. Mm -hmm. So that's the section that I thought was really interesting. And I wanted to hear your two cents about what he, what he had to say about Manhattan and the culture and um, what you want, <laughs> if you know what you want and, what, and if you don't know what you want. Yeah. Wow. All right. <laughs> no, that's good. I mean, I, I, I like that. And I think, I think there's a lot of that that's really, I mean, you know, there's nothing not true about that for sure. Mm. Um, and I think that it is a place where, I mean, I, you know, it's a, it's a place of doers. People are there for a reason and it, and it is true. It's, you know, um, people are there for a reason or you're just fucking around. Um, and the thing is, is that it's kind of a place where I remember feeling like all of a sudden I popped my head up and it had been three years and all I'd been doing was working, you know, I mean, you got Coney Island. There's like, you know, I mean, I think I'd been to the beach once, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it's, uh, uh, but it was like, it's a very open place. Um, I mean, my, you know, I was in Brooklyn, right? Yeah. So, um, I don't know about Manhattan specifically, uh, yeah. but, but it wasn't really happening in Manhattan. It was happening in Brooklyn, um, as far as I was concerned. And, um, um, everyone's from somewhere else and everyone's there for a reason. Um, and it seemed like this, this thing where everybody that I met if you just to sort of tag on to that, if you knew what you were doing, it was kind of like, Oh, where are you from? What are you doing here? Right. That was a, always the question. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Oh, I'm, you know, from here and this is what I do. Oh, that's crazy. I'm, this is, you know, I'm doing this. We should do something. And that door was continuously open because, um, just because people are there to do what they're doing. And, um, and if, and if you could work together, um, and then if you followed through, that was one of the great things I think that I loved about New York, especially, uh, compared to some other places, um, where it was, uh, we weren't just talking about stuff, we were doing it. Mm. And, um, and if you were doing it, then it just attracted more and more people that wanted to do it with you. Um, and so, at some point you just um, are a part of that momentum, mm -hmm. you know? And I mean, I think I got really uh, 
lucky and I mean I worked really hard for it as well but uh, to get to tap into that and be a part of uh, creating some of that instead of just watching it happen you were a part of the the living and breathing like the life of New York right I felt like it I felt like it yeah yeah you know I mean that's what was that's what like like when when I went there to visit I could see it and I could feel it and I was like that's that's what I need you know I need to do this yeah yeah you felt the energy of New York because it does have an energy for sure oh yeah yeah I wanted I just wanted to go there and get swept up in it and just you know see what got spit out on the other end yeah and uh, so so talk a little bit about Knickerbocker and what 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 you did there yeah well that was really yeah yeah that was a really special thing for sure um uh and uh because I got there uh didn't really know what I was gonna do um but I was doing the moccasin thing and so I actually you know tried to sort of like keep some of that going Mm -hmm. um but I had uh, learned how to make shoes in Vancouver as well. Uh, and of course I had, you know, shoe repair background. Uh, and I also wanted to always be an artist, right? So um, so I got to New York, uh, Brooklyn, and, uh, and then I ended up uh, in a studio, small studio. And uh, I um, found... Uh, on Craigslist, which in Canada would be like Kijiji. Yeah. Uh, but I found, uh, I found a shoe repair shop that was closing down. Uh, I didn't have any money. Right. So I, I just, I called them up and I said, Hey, um, let me know when you have to get rid of everything and I'll come and get it, you know, just keep me in, you know, in mind. Um, anyway, he was like, he was like, Oh, I'll sell it to you really cheap, whatever. I'm like, nah, uh it's cool just let me know when you don't when let me know when i can come and get it and uh um you know he wasn't too crazy about that actually but then he phoned me back a little while later and was like hey look you know i'll give it to you for this much you can come and take whatever you want i said you know what actually i'll come and get it for free like i won't even charge you to come pick it up like i'll clean out your space for free yeah uh, but just let me know when that's what you need you know Yeah. And he ended up hanging up on me, which I mean, yeah, rightfully so. And, Very New York, uh, eh? Very New York. Oh yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, next thing I knew, and I think it was maybe a couple weeks later or something, I get a phone call, and he's like, uh, he's like, yeah, yeah, this is the address, come and get it. So I went, and um, it was literally like he opened the door uh, and left yeah never saw him again opened the door and left yeah. so i took apart i had a there was a finishing machine uh an outsole stitcher everything you need for shoemaking or shoe repair shop um for nothing so wow. uh, so i cleaned it out got it to my studio in brooklyn and this was the sunny side of it maybe was it sunny side queens or was it like i don't know it might have been can't remember but it was it was so it was out there yeah Um, and uh, like i had to rent a u-haul or something and uh anyway got it back to the studio so i had so i set up a a shoe repair and shoemaking shop uh by appointment because it was in a studio in in brooklyn it wasn't like a retail space on the street somewhere it was you know and uh and then I also uh, turned it into like a sometimes gallery. So I would have uh, friends that were artists and we would do these collaborations and parties. So um, it would take some of their artwork or they would do something on some leather and I'd turn them into some shoes or whatever. And that would be kind of the thing. We would maybe like have a raffle uh, for the, for the collaborate, collaborative piece. And then their artwork would be up sale and then it would just be like a party um i i would even get like sponsors like i had sailor jerry sponsor my parties and stuff like that and uh i mean i didn't even know i didn't know what the fuck i was doing i was just asking people hey do you want to you want to like want to be part of this thing and do this thing sure okay cool and then like you know i mean even like one of those dudes is like has had artwork in like 
you know, that's in museums and shit now. Like, and, you know, and I've got some of his stuff on our wall and, you know, I was like, I had no fucking idea. Right. Yeah. 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 And, um, uh, but I just plugged in and just wanted to be a part of the, like, I just like, just wanted to get in the current and just, you know, like be in it. And, um, so I was, you know, I was, yeah, I was doing that. And, um, um, and then, you know, I would do some creative work out of there as well. Cause I just, you know, still wanted to do some of that stuff. And I had done some stuff with a skateboard shop in California and, um, and we had done a video, uh, that ended up going like being on hype beast or something. And, uh, and then some, uh, some kids from San Diego had a little shop in, uh, Williamsburg and they were just these scrappy scrappy kids i mean they were like 19 and uh dropped out of like nyu like living upstairs from this like little shop that they had where they would they were making uh like having stuff made um but they were also like uh sourcing vintage and repurposing clothing and doing like really cool stuff anyway they saw the um the thing that like the hype piece thing and then got in touch with me and uh i was like i don't know you know whatever and uh but i wanted to meet these guys and see what they were doing so i went and i realized oh yeah they're on some shit and uh um and there was a couple of them taylor spong and andrew livingston that were really like the standouts there as uh um you know the kind of like uh the ones that were really doing doing it and um uh taylor's a super gifted maker um like uh just as he, you know he can make anything he's he's uh just like um just fucking awesome and uh and aj is like a um just like a super creative design and and like uh you know biz whiz kind of kid it was just i was just like these guys are it's just crazy so i would go skateboarding and stuff with them and um anyway aj uh andrew uh wanted to have some hats made for his brand and his shop and uh and he found this uh factory in an old um print uh directory uh that you know was like ancient i mean i'm sure most of those places didn't even exist or don't you know at the time anymore but uh he found it went down there uh and at the time i was living in that neighborhood uh and uh and he was like oh you gotta come check out this shop i found so anyway he went there it turned out to still be a place that made hats so he was having hats made there and uh and he was like oh you should come check it out uh, one of my first Instagram posts ever, actually, which is a funny way to, you know, whatever, but was a picture from the factory, that visit cool. that we didn't even know. Like, there was no like, oh, yeah, we're going to get this place. It was just like, hey, look at this cool. It was a sewing machine. Like, look at this machine at this old place. Uh, anyway, um, and he was sort of like the old guy was always kind of like trying to sell him every time he'd come in trying to sell him the business yeah yeah and uh and so we just one day were talking and thought well we should kind of ask about that like maybe we should do that and uh and that's how that kind of started it became something that we were like all right well let's go talk to him and then another guy that uh, aj worked with uh, kyle moss older he uh um he came along for that discussion as well. And he was sort of like, um, uh, I guess he was like his studio was, uh, like, um, his lease was coming up or something. So it was an opportunity to sort of take this on. Cause I mean, uh, it was eight an 8,000 square foot space. Is that uh, the space that we visited and saw? Mm -hmm. It was. Yeah. 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 So it's a huge, like old style warehouse, yeah, eight thousand square feet is massive. Yeah. Hardwood, timber beams, I think. Yeah. Timber right? beams, timber posts, everything. Yeah. Like yeah. manufacturing style warehouse. Yeah. Square footage style space, right? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Big open space with just yeah. posts, pillar, you know, like uh, posts everywhere. 
but um yeah so we just like in that meeting we we just made a deal right there you know um i think the question was posed like uh you know what do you want and for this and you know he gave a price and i think i think it was me just i think i was like well how about this you know i think i cut it about in half almost in half uh next thing i knew we were shaking hands and then and then we went to like a coffee shop down the road uh which at that time in that neighborhood there was like one coffee shop and like one there was a grocery store and a little oh, restaurant yeah. like that was it you know and um and we talked about it and we're like yeah okay well let's we're gonna do this so we went and like wrote up a little contract and like we went back and you know said okay we will take it for that but we also want like we got i think we got like oh we had to talk to the landlord um and uh because of course uh he we were we were buying everything in the space and uh, uh but we didn't want to move it so sort of the deal was that if we can get a deal with the landlord we'll you know pull the trigger um and so we got we got the space for basically what he was paying for it and we got like a couple of months free to build it out and uh so i mean we ended up just almost not by chance but just like it was like a gift you know um to, we got 8000 square feet at pricing that was totally ridiculous for new york um and you know and so then we just you know um we just put all the sweat equity and and uh gorilla style like we just got in there we cleaned it out we we did so many dump runs um you know sold some stuff that we could and cleared out the space um and then we blueprinted it and figured out okay what do we need you know set up our shop and then we started uh well we built a uh mini ramp uh so one of the first things we did was build skate ramp yeah uh yeah and uh and then we started renting out other like space to other makers and designers um mind you there were no uh, the spaces weren't uh they were separate like this was your space but there were no walls or doors or anything it was all it was pretty open. much pretty much open yeah and uh so it created in a way this really interesting community of makers and designers uh and creative people and artists and all kinds of stuff yeah you created like a maker space right? yeah yeah mm-hmm. yeah which yeah. to be honest all we were trying to do was uh um sort of like basically like create a free space for us to like kind of continue to run our own businesses and actually when we bought the factory we thought okay this will be a good this will be the side hustle that pays for the space so that we can kind of you know do our continue to do our own thing uh but then it really quickly just uh took off as far as uh business goes i ended up putting all my stuff on hold uh and then ran the uh private label manufacturing that's what it started it didn't it wasn't a clothing company for a little while we were just making hats for other people yeah uh, as like a factory as a manufacturer yeah and uh, and then it was uh, uh so there was this dude felix who stayed on from the old owner and uh he taught us how to make the hats and it was me and him and uh and kyle uh and we would fulfill all the orders in the beginning uh, ourselves until we then also created a really great community of uh of makers that were our that became like our our crew our sewers and yeah yeah Yeah. Yeah. and did you guys also do a kickstarter campaign for knickerbocker as well yeah Yeah, we did yeah we did that for the factory yeah for the factory and it was successful right yeah yeah just yeah just you 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 hit the goal just yeah barely and i mean it was also that was a real learning experience too because it was a lot of work actually to do that yeah was it tough with the fulfillment side like after you you were were like yeah i did it oh god now i gotta like 
<laughs> fulfill yes. all the, all these order, orders? Is that the yeah. tough part? That was the tough part. Yeah, yeah, that was the tough part. I don't even remember, uh, you know, how successful we were at that. Um, yeah. But I remember being like, oh, this was like, was this worth it? Because we kind of, it was almost like taking on a project and getting paid up front. You know, where it was kind of like, oh, we got paid up front and that money's all going to things that we had planned for it to go to, but not to, you know, we didn't really, like we were just, we didn't know what the fuck we were doing. So we didn't really count for like, oh, we got to pay people to do this or do it ourselves. And then, and then, you know, and then start a project that we're not going to get paid till we're done anyway. So now we're just kind of like going from like getting paid and then doing all this work and then doing all this other work to then eventually get paid. Like, you know, it was tough. It was really tough. I mean, we, we really needed that money and it, and it can't, you know, um, uh, and it kept us going, but it was like, you know, there were so many tough, like times in that, in that business. The struggle of New where York. We thought, yeah, where we thought we were going to like, you know, be fucking done. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. people come and people go in. I mean, we had just, but we had just like, you know, it started off, we were trying to make it, you know, like a factory. We had like factory people and then that didn't, you know, we were like, this is not what we're trying to do here. And then, you know, and then it became like really just creative, like really, you know, creative people. Mm -hmm. Um where it just made sense. And I mean, a lot of them, part of the draw, cause I mean, we, you know, it's, you're not making a lot of money working in a factory, you know, or even, I guess we were probably more of a workshop than a factory, but, um, you know, so the draw was that they had access to, uh, all this equipment that you would never have at your own studio. Like you could never have all that stuff. Um, and, you know, so, so most of the people that we had there also had their own brands and then they had access to the space mm -hmm. to make, you know, on their own time to use that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, and then you, um, and then like after New York, cause you, you guys were there for, or you're there for about like six years and you moved to Philly. Yeah. Um, and what's what's that been like just switching switching pace again was it um again like i know you talked like you know life responsibilities and circumstances change and all that sort of thing um yeah. how 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 is that moving from new york to to philly and what what what's what's philly like what's what's been your experience in in philly as a as a creative uh Oh, it's just really different. I mean, you know, and uh, um, I did get to do some really cool stuff in New York and I got, and I made some connections there that opened up some really cool opportunities aside from, from Knickerbocker and uh, yeah, you know, where I got to, you know, um, yeah, be a part of some cool stuff. I got to make some, well, oh, sorry. Oh no. Yeah. Like a, um, um one of the one of the cool things was the was the bmx bike i did with the with nigel sylvester with the vintage louis vuitton and you know fully wrapped that um i got to do some workshops at moma like the museum of modern art in new york wow like, you know yeah. like that's crazy yeah and uh you know um and then like and i met uh jenna there and actually uh jenna started a magazine a long time ago and uh i was in the first issue of her magazine and we met at my first shop my little shoe shop uh for that uh piece in her in that in her the first issue of her magazine yeah that's amazing i didn't know that yeah and then when we actually got together it was uh uh we did a collaboration with the magazine for some ad space through knickerbocker and then uh that's when we ended up getting together but uh yeah you know and then so so philly was a uh um um big change it was an opportunity for jenna with her work um uh to take on a position here and i was still doing the factory but um you know, it was, uh, um, 
the, the factory really was some something that was super special and it was it was like a it was like a it was like an education uh where those years spent there um it it, it was almost like it wasn't meant to last forever it was kind of like you need to be here go through this and learn this and then go and and do something with it because it was too intense it was very like um i mean i think like what you know it's really like i think about the people that were there with us and how like i feel like it just it affected what we all did from there you know what i mean like it was like this like almost like this incubator or like a launching pad for like uh people to come and like you know go through that and then like end up doing something and and then being on the side where like i was like you know it was you know with a couple partners but my business uh well and then i mean i also had my own business within that space um yeah. you know it was like uh i was, was starting to really feel when this opportunity in philly philly came around that it was like I needed to start separating myself from that space anyway. Like I wanted to see what, like where else I could, you know, go uh, with that. Um, yeah, it was a chapter, so, right? It yeah, was, it was, like, a, chapter, it was yeah. a chapter. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and then it just was, uh, um, we came out here, we checked out, we didn't know anybody. We, you know, uh, I had been here once before. I don't even remember where I actually like now that I'm even here, I don't remember where it was that I <laughs> came when I did one time come here. Like, I don't even know what part of town that was like. Yeah. Um, so we had no connection uh, whatsoever to Philly. And then, uh, um, but we were like, um, we had started looking to buy a house in New York. And uh, of course we couldn't buy in New York or Brooklyn. So we ended up like looking upstate and um, this wasn't really working out. We were both self-employed. So uh, we did try to buy one house and uh, couldn't um, because of that. Uh, and then when we came out to Philly, uh, because Jenna's job was corporate, um, and the cost of living here i mean we we were able to buy a house in the city immediately so yeah. that was kind of like all right this is gonna like you know level us up here a little bit and uh and it's like a new chapter um uh, mind you i still had the factory for about a year year and a half actually about a year and a half uh while being in philly before uh our lease came up on the space and i was like I'm out. Um, and we ended up that actually everything shut down at that point. Yeah. Um, and then once I was like completely done with that, then things really came alive in Philly for me, you know? Um, cause I felt I was split. I felt like I was split up. Yeah. You, you, you were able to give your whole self and dive into where you are right now. I felt the exact same when we moved to, uh, to here to Penticton because I was working still through remotely at the place that I worked at in Winnipeg for a couple months. Oh, yeah. And it was hard for me to, I don't know, just like let myself fully immerse into here and get, yeah. and get my business started and look for opportunities out here because I was still tied. I still had responsibilities to in another city for another yeah. place that I work at where it was, I, I know exactly that, that feeling that it was just like you're split. Yeah. 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 Totally. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So it was, um, it was, it, I think it was a longer transition than, uh, than it needed to be just because of that, you mm -hmm. know, but I was able to maintain some, you know, like those good relationships there. Yeah. Like I totally. still do, uh, um, you know, I work with a furniture designer in New York, uh, Ben Erickson, his company is Erickson Aesthetics and, and the furniture is just like stunning. It's awesome. And it's so uh, beautiful. I'm going to put yeah. a link to some of this stuff that you've created the chair, like the, um, what, the what are they? Are they yeah. 
the day bed yeah the day rip, bed. Uh, yeah day bed and uh and then so i do the leather part of like a couple of his offerings and uh, uh but that's another connection through the factory and just through new york that like um you know uh was pretty special yeah um what was and, it like uh, what, what was it like seeing that louis vuitton wrapped bmx bike on a magazine with pharrell williams sitting ah, i was pretty crazy right i mean that is it's crazy yeah well like i i basically have touched his butt <laughs> <laughs> Jenna's shaking her head at me. <laughs> <laughs> you totally have. You totally have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 For sure. So, uh, so that's cool. I mean, you know, whenever you get to touch someone like Pharrell's, but it's a it, big deal. It is a big deal. Yeah. What? No. Uh, no. Yeah. I mean, it's cool. It's cool. It's yeah. really cool. I mean, it makes me. Uh, it. But it's funny. I mean, it is really again about. Uh, priorities and things changing like that was way bigger a deal to me than it would be now you know I think my motivations are very different yeah even now you know I mean that's cool but cool is what it is you know for like yeah I don't know there's a time and place in it and yeah I'm I'm super glad I got to dig into that what uh what's the best piece of art you're you're most proud of you can fire off multiple but if if there's one that really stands out to you that you're like holy shit i worked so so hard on that and i'm so proud with how how it it came out what what's uh what's one that stands out hmm I don't know. I don't know. That's really tough. I think, uh, um, I don't know. I don't know if it even makes sense. I think that the, um, probably the hardest I ever worked at, at something was the, was the factory. And, uh, and I know it's not a piece of art, but, um, I don't know. There was a certain uh, culture there, uh, and uh, a way that we all uh, worked together and shared. Uh, I don't know. There, um, we were all just figuring it all out together, uh, like the business, and just also like anything, everything. Whenever there was a problem, we would just all like, like, you know, it didn't matter if it was like whoever, what we just like, uh, like, you know, with the sewers and whatever, we just all sat down and figured it out. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, it wasn't like, I'm the boss. So I just fucking do whatever it is I'm telling you to do. Um, we were just kind of all figuring it out. Mm -hmm. And I just remember being like, uh, nothing else. Like there was like, that's all I did and lived for. Um, I remember, uh, and I've mentioned this before, but I remember one time, um, I was working and it was fairly early on in the, in the factory and I had a deadline and it was at a time when I didn't really know how to like sort of forecast our time and resources. And, uh, it was I'm sure it was a very unrealistic. Well, obviously it was an unrealistic deadline. Um, and I had, so we're already working long hours, but I, I was, so anyway, the next day was the deadline working, working, working. Um, it gets, it's getting late. People are leaving. Um, I have one, uh, Alex Kennedy was, uh, working with me as well and she stayed and we worked all night uh to try and meet this deadline and i remember going home when we were done going home laying down and my alarm went off to get up 
like literally, I did, I, I literally laid down and my alarm went off to get up. So I had a little cry. <laughs> yeah. And I got up and I got in the shower and I went back to work. And, uh, um, and so it was, I don't know, it was just one of those things I'll never forget. Yeah. Um, and I also, I mean, when, you know, it's, it's also something I learned from where, uh, you know, it's not that important. It, you shouldn't do that. Don't do that. You know, yeah. if I can get, tell you yeah. something, don't do that. Um, it's not that important. Um, yeah. It's just a deadline. You're not saving lives. It's not a big deal. Yeah. Uh, but it was very, it's just like nothing was more important than what we were doing. Yeah. At the time. Like nothing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And our, you know, and just like, yeah. And, and just that that was like the culture there, like that, you know, that, you know, Alex stayed and was like, nah, I got you. Let's do this. You yeah. know? And then it was, and it was just like that. It was like that. People like, I think back to like, fuck this, the crazy shit that we did. And that like, I can't believe these people did that with us. Like, like, fuck, wow. What yeah. is like, they were sacrificed so much just to like, be a part of that that i just i'm like wow what? yeah it was a yeah. special special chapter for sure for everyone yeah. involved it sounds yeah. like yeah yeah and i mean i think about like art and i love art still and i i you know i always want to keep making stuff but uh the collaborations are really where it's at to me that's the most that's the, that's the most rewarding stuff and and that that place was just a massive collaboration yeah you know that was no one's big idea i mean uh my you know my grandfather would say ideas are like assholes everybody's got one you know but it takes people to make it happen and be a real thing yeah, yeah. oh i love that um what does art mean to you i don't know i don't know that's uh yeah i don't know i mean think thinking of of art logically a lot of it doesn't make any sense right like why do people do art really like why right, right? right. and um <laughs> like i i might answer this question <laughs> for me but yeah. I just thought of something. I, I watched the movie recently. Uh, I think it's called The Walk, and it's with uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, and he he plays this um, French wire walker, and he oh. he was a guy who walked on a wire that he set up himself with a small team across the Twin Towers in New York, and he wire walked like a, from one tower to the next tower. And it was yeah. right when they opened in the seventies and he starts the movie with, um, the, the question that I get asked most is why, why do I walk the wire? Why do I do what I do? Yeah. And his, and his answer is basically he feels the most alive when he's doing it. It's living. It's not fear. He feels the most alive when he's right. actually doing that. So his answer is like, life and i guess like for artists like why do they do something or what does it mean to them it means it means life it means it it gives them life i don't know if that's if that's a an all well, yeah, and I, answer but no i think i think that's cool and i think you know he's doing something that is a life or death situation yeah. and so that would you know would be very you know um i i totally get that and i think to say for myself it, it it's more it's not as much about feeling alive as feeling like um it's what i'm what you're supposed to be doing like um it's just it's sort of that thing where uh like i could do on, only that and i don't it's not about like getting paid you know you're not like it's not a job where you're like i'll do this because i'm gonna make a fair wage of this or whatever i mean people will make art and you know starve for it well starving artists right but like i mean really like you know it's it's i think it's thing it's depending on person is thing something that um 
to varying degrees you will do anything uh, to be able to do that. Yeah, it's like doing the saying, do, um, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. Right, yeah. Mind you, I don't, I don't necessarily buy that either. No, I, why, why not? Uh, I mean, I feel like I, uh, I do and I don't. I, just that, um, that I think uh, um, I love what I do and, I, I, and I've done a variety of different, like since I was 24 and I opened that shop. I mean, I had a couple part-time jobs at shoe repair shops in Vancouver, but uh, I never, I've never had a job since. And, um, and, uh, and I've, you know, done what I want and, you know, and, uh, and loved what I do. Uh, but that shit's fucking work. If you want to pay the bills and you want to, you know, there's full shit. You still got, you still got work to do, you yeah. know, so that you can do what you love. I mean, even now, I mean, I love, you know, I doing what I'm doing in the crew. Oh man, we work really hard though. Mm -hmm. We work really hard to make that, to allow ourselves to do it, what we want. Yeah. yeah so talk a little but, bit about what you're doing right now. You guys are doing reno, renos, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, which is funny. I mean, again, you know, I probably never would have thought I'd ever do that. Like as a, as a career. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but you know, it, it was, uh, uh, when we moved out here, um, I was in New York half of the time, really part of the time, uh, for the first while. So, but then when I was here, I was doing, I got my real estate license here. So I, you know, cause I had to do something right. And, uh, while for the time that I was here, uh, so I did that and then started doing a little bit of that, but then I was also like doing the furniture stuff with Ben. And then I was doing like, uh, some odd jobs here and there as, as far as like, someone that Jenna worked with needed their backsplash tiled or something I'm like, oh, yeah, I can do that, you know, and started a little bit like little stuff like that. And then, uh, then the lease came up at the studio or at the factory. Uh, so that ended. Uh, and then I was here full time trying to figure out what the fuck I'm going to do with all my time. And, uh, and we ended up uh, buying this house and it was, a grandma house like it's, it was a, like it was a gut job and the fixer uh, upper fixer upper big time so we spent all, all last summer uh basically gutting it and doing as much of the fixing up as we could and uh and i ended up with a crew um at the beginnings of a crew anyway from that time and just from people wanting to like you know help out and 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 learn and work and uh and then from from this place we just started lining up jobs after this after you know this house and now uh and then it got to a point where um when jenna was on uh, maternity leave she was de like designing she was, so we were like a design build team then so i wasn't just like coming in to put some hardwood floors in we were like designing spaces or jenna was and i would then build it and good match. Uh, which, good match you guys it was a good match yeah yeah and then uh and then basically yeah when she went back after after her leave then uh we yeah it was just like realized that that was such a big part of the business um mm -hmm. she ended up quitting and then um and we part you know so we're partners mm -hmm. and uh and it's just like now we're just expanding we're creating another big you know group of like like-minded people that are you know trying to like make a go of this yeah actually <laughs> so one question that i wanted to ask you about you know you've you've done so many different things and you've ran a bunch of businesses and everything so through through all your your years of being an entrepreneur and running you know different various types of businesses and that what what are three things that you think make a successful business oh oh yeah you know i yeah it's funny i i think that that's a that's a really good question um and it's kind of like uh my grandpa 
telling me I should buy that business when I was 19 and then not doing it and learning in the end that I probably should have done it. You know, uh, I could tell you all kinds of stuff and it doesn't, you know, it's just gotta, it doesn't really matter. Uh, because you'll figure it out. Right. But, uh, or not, but, um, for me, what I have learned is that, uh, um, for a business to be like a, um, viable is really important as far as like, uh, it's got to be able to support you and whoever else is involved. Um, or it doesn't matter how much you love it. You, if you can't, if you can't pay the bills, it's not worth it. Um, and I think I've also learned that there's a lot of different things you can love to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, you know, I might really like, like I really wanted to make shoes and, uh, you know, maybe had I stuck with it, I would have a successful business doing that. Uh, but I just wasn't really, uh, it didn't work out for me. And then, and I thought, ah, oh, shit, I have worked all this, you know, time and learned all this stuff, uh, to not do this. Uh, but I still get a, a creative satisfaction out of, you know, there's a, way more, you know, there's, there's just, I don't know, a lot of different outlets. Mm -hmm. Um, so I guess finding something that you love to do, um, and that's also a viable business. That's like super important. Mm -hmm. Uh, cause I, you know, I mean, I'm sure, you know, there's lots of businesses out there and I've had them myself where. Uh, you know, you're just slogging along and it's a slog because it's maybe not a viable business or maybe just the model needs adjustment or, you know, I don't know. And I also, uh, one of the things that um, I've learned too, or that I think is important is, uh, uh, is working with other people that as a group, you can do more than a single person can alone. Um, you know, and, uh, and then, uh, again, another thing would be, uh, leveraging your time. Uh, that's the, maybe the most important thing. Um, if you are, if you got to do the books, if you got to make the pattern, if you got to sew the thing, if you got to make the thing, if you're cleaning up after it, if you're doing that, good fucking luck. I mean, it's cool. It's fun and it's possible, but I mean, I mean, that's hard. It's hard. I, I did that for a long time. It's really, it's just hard. Yeah. Um, so if, if your product or service that you offer doesn't have any room to allow you to leverage time, like say hiring an accountant or hire a helper to uh, make some stuff for you or uh, whatever it is to leverage that time so that you can do what you need to do to make the business uh, successful or turn it into what it is that uh, you see it becoming. Yeah. Uh, otherwise you're just going to, you know, through your day, just getting to, to just try and get through your day. That's yeah. when, that's when you're, that's when you're putting your head down and the alarm goes off to get up. Yeah. You're not leveraging your time. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. That's really good points. Um, what's, uh, I'm going to ask a few like rapid fire questions and it doesn't have to, you, you don't have to answer quickly. Um, but I'll just ask, uh, ask a few of these and then maybe we can wrap up. Cause I know we've been going for quite some time here. <laughs> How are you doing on time? Good. I'm good. sure. Uh, I'm sure Jenna could use a break. Yeah. 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 Okay. Sounds good. I'll just, I'll, I'll fire off just a few more. <laughs> He's ready for you in the background. Yeah. yeah. Um, what's, what's one thing no one knows about you? One thing no one knows about me. I don't know. Jenna's looking at me. I don't know. Woo. Um, Oh, I got a little tattoo here on the inside of my lip. Oh. It says greaser. <laughs> <laughs> That's wild. What yeah. what's uh what's your favorite tattoo? Um, quite a bit. Uh 
Mm. That's my favorite taffy. I don't know. This is my first one. Yeah. Yeah. I was in high school and uh, I drew that and, and on a piece of paper and then had my friend tattoo it on me. Yeah. And then I have like, um, you know, uh, this one. Right now it's upside down, but if you look at it the other way, it's like a pine tree. Okay. Uh, and uh, I was out camping with uh, some friends and we did uh, some homemade tattoos with the charcoal from the fire from the night before. So that is from like ink that I made from the charcoal and then tattooed a little pine tree. No way, that's awesome. Uh, and so I have a bunch of uh, tattoos that are like, uh, like with friends where I'll give you one and you give me one and they're like yeah. sticky pokes. Yeah. Um, and then I have stay gold on my hand. So, and I did, I gave myself those too. Uh, but that's like from the outsiders, uh, which is also then that's kind of that reference there is from uh, a poem. Um, and then, uh, and then I have uh, friends that are artists that I've got tattoos from. And, uh, and then I have some tattoos that mean something and some that don't. Yeah, yeah. 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 What um what traits do you hope to instill in Frankie? <laughs> oh. I don't know. I just want him to follow his heart. Love it. You know whatever that is. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I think to me, the, I think I just, I just don't want to uh, uh, project or inflict any uh, like restrictions on him from anything that I do or feel or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I just, uh, traits, I don't know, just free spirit, uh, you know, uh, determination. Uh, work, you know, good work ethic. I mean, those are things that I try to do, you know. Yeah, yeah. How how has being a, a father changed you? Um, well, it's changed what's important uh, in, my, in my life. And, and in a way, just that, like, um, uh, when I think about the future and what, uh, like, you know, my plans for the future are no longer just like, what do I want to do? You know, it's, it's really like, it's all about, you know, mm -hmm. him and us as a family and what, like, mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah, like that's where, that's the big perspective change on, you know, any, even like the big decisions and stuff. It's, it's not about, yeah, that's the thing. It used to be about me and what, what I wanted to do and what, you know, I thought was a good idea. And now it's what's a good idea for us. What's going to be best for him. Yeah. Yeah. And what, uh, what's, this is the last question I'll ask is a two parter. What, what, uh, what inspires you and, or, or who inspires you? And, uh, and then I'll just wrap up with like, what's, what's next for, for you? Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, er everything. I, I everything inspires me. <laughs> you know, and tiles I, too, right? Right. Well, I mean, er yeah. I, mean, I get you know, I love, I get insp inspiration from the stupidest shit. But uh, um, yeah, and then you know, uh, lots of people. I mean. I'm fortunate to be surrounded by inspiring people. Um, you know, uh, my grandfather was a big one. My mom is huge inspiration to me. Um, I, you know, um, I just, uh, um, yeah, I just think, I don't know. Um, what's next for me is, is 
is is is what's next for us that's that's kind of like how i feel it's like it's just it's not what's next for me it's what's next for us and then and what's next for us is uh um you know we're doing a family business now i mean we're doing we're making big changes just to um we want to have the time you know i mean i'm done i don't want to work that i you know i you know i don't have a problem working hard but i don't need to like break my back to uh, you know uh, i'd rather have less and more time you know yeah totally yeah, yeah. yeah. shifting priorities and all that yeah. Stuff. yeah 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 but what's next for us is spending more time with family yeah all of our family yeah yeah that's awesome you know, i remember i like i haven't even you know i haven't traveled uh, the world i've been to a couple places now but like mm-hmm. I hadn't been outside of like North America since the last uh, last year or two, a couple of years or whatever. Um, you know, I'm 40. I mean, you know, I always wanted to travel. I always wanted to see the world and do all these things. But but I was busy. You know, I was working. I was making stuff. I was like, and I'm glad for that. I mean, that's, I was doing what I wanted to do. And it's funny though now, like, uh, you know, if I'm like, you know, I want to do those things, but now I want to do that stuff with family. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't even care where it is necessarily. Like, mm-hmm. you know, seeing the world is like, yeah, that's cool, but I got people to see. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, totally. I think that's a perfect, perfect spot to wrap up. So <laughs> um, thank you so much for just sharing those, you know, gems of wisdom and beautiful experiences. And, and thank you for just everything you're 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 very inspiring i very very much look up to you and and jenna and and i just love you guys so thank you so much for being up for doing this thanks dean that means a lot that really means a lot yeah all right and uh i'll i'll put everything that we chatted about in the in the show notes which people can find at simple to understand.com and then i'll also share this video on my youtube channel as well and uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, I've been setting my own hair, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Me too. <laughs> hey, all right, that's looking good. It's looking good. <laughs> that's awesome. Is there any? Is there any like um, parting bits of advice or anything that you want to share before wrapping up? And uh, anything that people that watch or listen to this, any anything that you'd like to end on? No, I think. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. 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 Presence being, being, it's all happening right now. Right. Yeah. 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 Totally. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, thanks so much, Dan. And thanks Frankie. You can spend some time with pops now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We'll see you guys. All right. Okay. Cheers. Bye Dean. <laughs>